to you know, hopefully excite some of you about um, this thing that seems to be so much on everybody's radar and everybody is talking about the metaverse and what is this metaverse and how are we all going to interact with it. And I'm pretty much here to say that we're already all working and interacting in it. Um, it's just kind of clunky right now. Um, so the phone in your pocket or the device at home is pretty much your access tool to the metaverse as it is currently being experienced. Um, but we are here to talk a bit today about how us as designers and spatial thinkers, architects and tier designers um, really need to engage with the metaverse and not think of it as some tool or a game that children are playing with, um, but something that we can really take part in and help to create and make such a beautiful place. It's happening and um, I think it's something that we should all be excited to take part in. Uh, again, my name is Marcus Guillard. Um, I am a founder of One Hat, One Hand. We are a design and fabrication studio here in San Francisco with a focus on public art and architectural placemaking. Um, and I also have founded a company called RK Virtualis, which is a virtual art museum, which we'll share a little bit about today. And this is Esty Myers. Hi, uh, I'm an exhibitor at Fog for several years with our gallery, R and Company. And uh, by no means am I an expert about the metaverse, and nor am I going to try to pretend that we are as uh, we're going to develop the metaverse. I, I really want to talk about how I think it could be effective for us as a design gallery and what and how it could um, either help influence work, encourage, inspire people to go further than maybe where they have, just like for the same reason why we're at the fair here today. And I'll be showing you examples of other things that I think can work haven't worked, can't work yet from technology, which might be surprising that technology isn't there yet as a way of things to discuss, and what else and how we've become effective in expanding our marketplace, particularly during a time of a pandemic where most people aren't visiting our retail locations in uh, New York City. Yeah, so I can say that, you know, certainly the last two years has rapidly accelerated um, this as a, as a topic of conversation, certainly to see us here at Fog Fair talking about this um, is certainly interesting. So thank you all for being here. Um, just as a quick introduction, um, this is a, a graphic uh, shared by Epic Games and Unreal Engine. I just shared this to um, just offer the, you know, kind of a graphic representation of what the metaverse will look like, but also to share with you uh, the company and uh, the software that, that we have, are using with some of the examples we'll be sharing today. Um, but certainly um, keep an eye on Epic Games and Unreal Engine. They are certainly making the tools that will allow all of us to create these extraordinary, um, you know, virtual representations of much of the design work we're doing. Um, I also just wanted to kind of share, you know, it, the metaverse is being shared certainly to your children, to our children. Uh, they're being indoctrinated into this idea of the metaverse. And so this is, you know, popular culture showing it in, in movies such as Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, we're seeing it in um, online worlds that are being currently navigated. People are attending, going and building, you know, worlds. Altspace and Decentraland are certainly representing that right now. Um, you may have all remembered uh, Second Life, and we all laughed at it many years ago, but um, it has continued to you know, make headway, and we are certainly seeing this come to fruition. Um, companies such as Spatial.io are developing workplace tools that are allowing people to utilize augmented reality and virtual reality to explore, you know, to come to work and really work together. Um, so we're seeing a lot of rapid acceleration in that space. And we're seeing designers work specifically in the virtual space, designing shoes that have not really been, have not gone to uh, production, but are being bought and sold in the metaverse. Uh, we're seeing furniture designers and uh, architecture, and you know we have the Mars house that's selling as an NFT. So we're all we're all very well aware that this is happening, and so we want to really talk about how can we engage in it. Um, just a couple examples of artists that I've been following. Andres Reziger, uh, if you've not seen this, Impossible Furniture, um, really beautiful concepts that are designed, were intended to be NFTs, and because of the um, excitement around them, they are now being created in the real world as furniture for sale, or at least as artworks for sale. Uh, 
We have uh, Misha Khan as another artist that I've been following, who's also been working, you know, pretty heavily in NFTs, but is now producing much of his work in uh, as, as you know, furniture that can be purchased as well. So there's really this cross platform back and forth between what is the metaverse now, uh, what we are all hearing as NFTs, and then you know, real world objects. Uh, and then I myself have been working um, to design much of my work in a virtual space. Um, so designing everything in 3D, uh, being able to visualize it, and then actually produce it and have it here uh, today, so you're able to see, and you know, I want to be able to show you how we can have a real-world representation, and then shortly you'll see some video and some images of what it looks like and what can be the tools now are al allowing us to have in the metaverse. A couple other shots here, um, and here you'll just see some video where we're, you can see the quality of the of the rendering of the material, and so we've come so far as to how we can replicate and showcase works on a global scale around the world, certainly with, in our current experience over the past two years, wanting to be able to share, uh, you know, on, on, and without being able to maybe come to some of these events, we can share them globally. People can actually put on a headset and walk around it, get as close as they possibly can without touching and, and smelling it. But, um, uh, and then just an example of what it looks like to see as though you're wearing a headset. And so while we're all, Many of you have probably not worn a headset. Um, it is quite an experience to go into a virtual headset and walk around. And so I'll get into this a little bit more in a moment um, to explain the space where these furniture items are shown. Um, but uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that Zesty has been exploring. And certainly, I think, I, you know, ways in which we are um, not fully able to realize things in the virtual space. And so today, all the images that I will be showing are, none of them are augmented, they're all real photographs. And so this was an exhibition we did last year on an artist named Johnny Swing, who makes furniture out of coins, and they're very architectonic. Um, today, there is no scanning and no other technology that would really help this in the metaverse yet. But it sort of already looks like it should be in the metaverse from the shapes and the forms. It's sort of um, surprising. Um, Detail isn't really there yet. So when you look around in the metaverse yet, this is why you're seeing more hypercolor, blocky things, blobby things, organic things so far. Um, this, this will be a big change because something like this, I think, could be really well and do really well in the metaverse. So let me explain um, how, because when you look at these pieces, you see, and I wanted to show the depth of the backside or the front side, and there's so much detail going on. In the end, most of our clients that come to us aren't, they like visual things, but they don't know how to visually place things in their own aesthetic, their own homes, their offices, their dwellings. The, you know, after all these years, it's something I or the designer takes for granted sometimes. Um, if we had renderings of your home or through your architect or decorator, if you had one and we could drop this in and you could actually walk around it and feel it in that kind of way, you'd really be able to see spatially if it actually really worked and how it could be effective in your home. And if we needed to turn it 20 degrees, it wouldn't be an issue. This, this is a huge advantage for us to accomplish the goals for the people that we want to represent. This is where I see us having um, access in a way that we, um, we can have for how many people maybe that aren't coming to the gallery in New York today or aren't taking this kind of work on approval. Um, I think this will speed things up and, and increase certain people's careers in a way that they've never experienced. So this, this really excites us for those kinds of opportunities that are to come where I think an architecture and design community as an industry will have to grow into this for presentation to clients as well. And the same thing with these forms from Jeff Zimmerman and James Mongrain. You know, the, the big hanging spheres are up to um, like 30 inches in diameter. But the metaverse isn't going to quite pick up all this detail yet. Um, they would have to be hand drawn in, but then that gets self-defeating because then it isn't someone else's work. So even though we can, we can photograph it and have decent photographs, um, this still isn't quite ready to work for this detail. The shape is ready, but not the detail. Yeah, we had talked about trying to, you know, 3D scan some of the work that he has in the showroom here at Fog Fair, and we, we very quickly realized that a lot of the works would be quite challenging to, to replicate right now. Oh, just another shot of the same thing. But in here, if we can get these things into the world, then we can create the depth and the right perspective. And perspective is so hard for people to understand, or the power of presentation. And this is where we have to, so once a, a designer or an artist gives us something, 
either we present it right or we present it wrong, no matter how we have to present it. If it's in, in person, via a photograph, um, through a, a sketch, whatever it is, it's the value of presentation that makes us successful. It's a different level of an artwork that I say. And this might look like the metaverse, but this is Rogan Gregory, who we're also showing today in our booth. But this is um, a, vign a whole vignette of what you know, he desires to really do and build whole rooms for people that we did at Design Miami uh, either two years ago or three years ago. His shapes fit the metaverse beautifully. The metaverse is ready for this. Rogan's work would be, would be great, is great for the metaverse. This is the style of work that it can really handle so far and what we can really do. Um, but yet, this is also real. So, you know, photography isn't something that we will put by the wayside for this compared to how we would scan and then capture or would then render, but it's another use of how we will then layer up to uh, find success for the people that we represent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to talk, and some of you have probably seen this, when, um, and I think it, this is really where it gets to be really interesting and important. So when uh, Mark Zuckerberg a couple weeks ago or a month and a half ago announced that Facebook has a new name of Meta, I'm sure some of you watched the video, and this, this is of the home that he was standing in that was sort of um, somewhat sort of designed. <laughs> And, you know, Marcus has mentioned that, you know, when you wear these VR goggles, and that is the mode right now, but we all know the goggles are, uh, goggles are going away, um, which I think will help with other people's stability as well. They're going to be, um, Ray-Ban is coming out with a ver variant of form, and I think they'll eventually be contact lenses, et cetera, will be how we'll use it, and, and, or it will be through something that reflects off us onto our phone or onto a wall, um, was what, where the technology will go. But in here, about how to conceive design, um, is something that I think they sort of put together that I don't think is really thought out yet. And that's really interesting to me of where I think or what I think is going to need to happen because um, one of the things I think we all want or the reasons why most people come to a fair like this is hopefully to find things that define their taste, who they are, how they want to live, the things they dream of. And the metaverse can be a different level of that representation or things to try out. Maybe to test, maybe to collect maybe to have the NFT, maybe then to eventually come back to buying the three-dimensional work. I think it will open a door in a different way for some people that aren't ready to go with the, to buy some of the things of scale that we're seeing in the size of the dwelling that they drew to be able then to live or how to place or how to then um, get interior design or interior architecture to happen for the structures or dwellings that people are going to be building inside of the metaverse. And just more of the same. And if you look at the how the objects are being drawn, it, they are basic forms still, right? So I sort of wanted to show this from what he's, he's now presenting to the world as of what I think will change in the next year or two very rapidly. And this gets more to the point where the individuals are there that he's hanging out with, which is wonderful. But none of them have VR goggles on, which shows that there's going to be a future without these goggles, right? Because they would have shown them if that was the only way. But the thing that's missing is the interior design from their hangout, their office, whatever this place is actually called for them. Um, and that could become anything. And I think that's where we will have a big say in what um, are how to make people define taste inside of this world for their escapism or for meetings, for lectures, to work with the sponsors that sponsor fairs like this, to work with industry on a bigger level. Um, we can host events, we can multiply the form in a way where I only might have one to be able to be sold, but then everyone could be sitting in that same kind of chair for this kind of talk, which I think would be really interesting. And people could feel it and be around it in a different way to have an experience. Yeah, I, I very much agree that, you know, a lot of what we're seeing out there um, in, in these metaverse experiences that are currently being created is, is a lack of uh, intention and design and detail. Um, and, you know, just you're really getting, it's coming from the video game world, it's coming from the computer coding world, and there has yet to really be an effort to, you know, really focus on what we all find so important. And I think, you know, what really creates the human experience is that, that beauty around us, um, you know, not to control the experience, but to really kind of guide the, the, the experience by choosing the right color or choosing the, the materials. Uh, and we're just not seeing that happen in the metaverse. And so certainly we all see this as, a, as an opportunity and it's happening. And so I, you know, I encourage us all to get more involved in this um, and, and really you know, lend your, your skill set to designing a beautiful metaverse. Um, yeah. 
And so I wanted to talk about um, training and why, and sort of start to show why I think particularly design is going to be so important for the metaverse. And so we're, we're simply looking at a video game that we've all heard of, of Grand Theft Auto, that's been around for many years, over a decade now, I think. Um, and one of the things that they've been able to do with this is use uh, the auto industry to their advantage. Um, but the auto industry that they use are highly designed vehicles. All these vehicles are actually real. People want these vehicles. People now collect these vehicles. The collectible car market, since this has emerged, has gone hand in hand with the taking off of collecting um, cars to a level that no one's ever seen. So the power of influence to change a generation has already come out from something that wasn't real for then what people wanted as a designed object. Um, and this is just one proof of it. Fashion is also being, has been already been proved through this kind of language, um, which would be in the, I think the next picture would be um, just the fashion of being whatever you wanna be um, at whatever moment of time. And as we already all know in the metaverse, we can change our styles at a moment's notice to be whatever we think we should or want or desire that maybe we can't be in our regular life, but there we can express ourselves in many different ways. But this all comes from uh, predictive programming um, which is what we've seen through the video game industry of how they've, of whatever they think is interesting, right, cool, fun, whatever these words may be. Not that um, it's something that I personally like or think is always right, but it's the way that we're all trained to see what becomes um, more normal or more common or more accepted or more of the wants of, uh, that people think they need to crave. Yeah, one thing to note as well is, you know, I think, did you, I saw an image of you the other day, you were, you were, were you getting your avatar created? Was that what you were yeah, doing? Yeah, I, I got shot by 230 or 40 cameras the other day for the first time ever, um, which is uh, fantastic. And for fashion, that the, the industry is really, really there to be able to do this, to photograph the clothing with those 260 or 30 cameras. Um, but it's not so there yet that then to take this chair in there because it's set up for a different scale. Um, and it's, um, but this will come with the cameras, but the scanning is getting that much better. Yeah. Um, and then you, the depth you can go into to see the microfibers of how things are made is incredible with that kind of detail. It, it would be a dream of mine to be able to present to a client for them to see all of the detail that I can't show them in a single photograph. And even my video and my iPhone isn't good enough yet. Uh, for why they might like something, or why something's important, why someone did so much time with the embroidered work, or the, or how they painted the surface. If um, this is where I'm so excited to be able to use parts of the metaverse and this kind of technology, or some kind of scanning, so they can see every nook and cranny in a way that I can't possibly show them yet. Um, yeah, so as we were just talking about, you know, some of the tools that are allowing this all to happen. Um, as Zesty was mentioning, photogrammetry, using many, many cameras around a person or around an object, around a design, around things. We're, we're, we're designing the uh, capabilities to be able to photograph uh, in, in dimension and capture the textures at, at very close range with very high resolution. And then we're able to take that image and stitch it together and then bring it into the computer and they're figuring out ways to scale it and package it in such a way that when they reduce it down to be um, rendered, that they're maintaining all of that uh, resolution. So um, really being able to capture you know, designs and artworks, and as we were saying in the earlier images where we have complications with currently being able to capture and replicate at, to really represent an artwork um, and not just a uh, kind of a, a, a you know facsimile of it, or a, you know a, a bad facsimile of it, which is extremely important to the artist. So uh, the technology is coming online. Uh, what I'm showing here is you know we have headsets now. We have augmented reality headsets which allow you to see in the current space and the people in front of you, but you will also see a holographic image of a, something in front of you, um, which will probably be the, the, the sooner adapted, adopted technology. We'll all see more, more, more relevant in our, in our population soon. Um, the VR technology allowing you to enter into a, a, a space that's been created, um, so you're not there, but the the designs can be there in front of you, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. Um, but also, the you know the technology of 5G will be crucial to allowing us to actually um, 
now currently you're, you're working from a computer or from a hard drive, eventually these headsets or whatever it is we're on will be connected to our 5G system. Everything will stream from a server and you will be able to have real time conversations with 10 different people from anywhere in the world standing in a, in a room, looking at furniture, walking through a museum, seeing a conference such as this, the technology is, is already happening. It's just not readily available to all of you, but it is so close and it is really happening at an exponential speed faster than any technology has ever come online. And I think, I think one of the other more important things too is, is for us is uh, we sell historical design that goes back like 100 years, let's say, in time. And America has a law that to be an antique, it has to be 100 years old, unless it's just vintage or used furniture sort of a strange line as uh, the Christie's and Sotheby's also sell these for incredible sums of money um, for where we are. But for pr I have to follow, a lot of times what we try to do is prove to our client that what we're s selling them or could sell them is actually authentic, real, the real thing. We have uh, tr the traditional method, books were a great way, ephemera was this way, magazines, uh, other posters, et cetera, from different past exhibitions. But in the future, with proof of value, proof of stake, if we can capture these details, and then we can lock it up as an NFT with the right smart contracts. We will always have this there forever with, with detail in a way that we can't have it today. The, everybody will do this for future to prove what they actually own is real um, in a way that they can encode and do different things. And then it also could be out there on the blockchain. This is where I think it, this technology gets really smart in a different way to help protect people, help protect artists' career help get other um, artists or designers residuals in the future, potentially if the work is resold because someone's bought the contract in the way um, we decided to do it, me as the dealer and, and the person we're representing. All of this will be there from how we can capture these pieces, but then we can take them so much further to expand careers instead of one at a time. This, this becomes amazingly helpful to certain people. Now, of course, there's always gonna be the people that only wanna make 10 to 20 things a year, but so many of the people we have, so many more people want access to what we have. And in some cases, I think it's right from how the, the practice of the people we're representing works, that there should be a different level of, of collectability, of fan base, uh, call it what you will, of getting access to, to feeling like they're a part of something that they love and cherish in a way that maybe there could be an affordability for them compared to buying the one piece at a time that can, they can make. What I'm saying is nothing new though. This has happened for hundreds of years in the art world of doing editions. Um, you know, you could simply look at Alexander Calder and of the editions or Juan Moreau coming out with the editions in the 70s or going back to Door from 300 years ago and doing editions. This, this is something that's gonna con that's continued to happen or Warhol making editions of the same piece. If Warhol could have made NFTs, he would have been first to market. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, but this would have been perfect for a way for him to multiply and get these things. But now I think there's a level of how it can be done even better or hopefully be protected for the long-term future because each one of these uh, pieces of art or an NFT or design can, will also come with a contract. Yeah. Just, yeah, something I, you know, I like to, not everybody is equally, you know, up to speed on, but a lot of people think of Bitcoin when they think of blockchain, but just remember that blockchain is, a, is about transactional technology, uh, allowing us to transact through, you know, different means than we're used to, and that NFTs are, are not all about, you know, gimmick artwork, they're, they're about ownership, and so it's, it's really about being able to place ownership on a digital asset and it's that technology and it's the transactional technology of blockchain that are really exciting. You know, it's fun to think about Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the money that's happening there, but it's really the technology that is going to allow the metaverse to happen where we can all have some ownership of our assets, our avatar, our information, uh, and we can transact uh, quickly without the need to go to the bank or through other assets and, you know, as you were saying, we're all already using, um, we're, we're digitally transacting anyway. Uh, well, well, that's for sure. We're, we're already on, on the blockchain since you guys use credit cards and bank cards and we trust that as cash. So the idea of the, the crypto is no different, but I think more of a goal that I have is to try to, or, or a goal that the people we represent want is to try to go as far as we can to get their work out to a public. And there's many parts of the world that, will, that it's not allowed or it's unaffordable to ship the work to that country. They can't import. But maybe through uh, the metaverse or via an NFT in the metaverse, um, they can actually partake. 
in places where they can't be public. It still has to be private. Or it's even, you know, uh, and I think there's going to be amazing access to other parts of the world for this, uh, for us to grow um, the fan bases for people and to have a different kind of client that physically can't, well, can never import the, import the work to certain parts of the world. I'm really, really looking forward to how we can get to those other kinds of people that would love to have this experience. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are allowing us to do this. 3D modeling tools such as Rhino or Fusion 360 or the tools that I'm using for my line of work uh, are really allowing us to model and, and make extremely dynamic you know, um, 3D structures which are then allowing us to bring it into software such as Unreal Engine which we're able to basically create cinematic uh, real world lighting and texturing um, and full 3D, what they call real-time rendering. So we're rendering it from all angles. Um, and uh, you're seeing here, you know, artists are beginning to use these tools to design in, you know, from the origin point, they're working with virtual reality to design. And so the tools are just beginning to be created to do that, but we're gonna see that become more readily available in the near future. Um, my company, One How and Hand, we're using augmented reality to pre-visualize artworks before we place them in the public, uh, or for people to look at a piece of furniture in their uh, in their space. Um, so augmented reality is certainly allowing us to do that as well. Um, and here's an example of how we're bringing you know artworks to life where they would otherwise be two-dimensional or non-reactive. We're actually placing a augmented overlay, um, making the artworks a much more dynamic you know uh, interaction. Um, I think we're all aware that we're seeing it extremely uh, popular in our experiences. We're seeing artists such as Jenny Holzer using AR to uh, apply you know, the, the message onto places where we might not get permission to do so. Uh, we're seeing the artist calls, um, install, you know, breaking the rules of physics to install um, installations over top of rivers, but really um, allowing artists to really explore um, other opportunities. Um, a quick introduction before we just get into a bit more of a conversation here. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, I myself as an artist was looking for ways in which I could continue to create. Uh, and I wanted to um, you know, design, but not being able to fabricate, I, we started designing everything in 3D. Uh, and I started creating uh, showrooms to put them into. And then um, I realized that uh, the technology allowed much more than that. And so uh, I set out to design a, an, a, a museum. Uh, and as an architect, I realized I could build my own museum. Uh, and I didn't have to hire a general contractor. I didn't have to work with any permitting. Uh, so we built a fully immersive architectural experience um, with over 30 galleries. Uh, we have outdoor plazas. Um, and so we have curated this with up to 25 artists right now, um, many of them sculptors, photographers, painters. Um, and this is fully navigable in a, an immersive virtual reality headset. You can walk through the entire museum, get close to the artworks. You can see dialogue boxes that pop up where you can read about the artist. There's so much you can do with this. I could have guided tours with the artist walking you through the space. We can have you connect directly to the artist, to the gallery, or you can donate to the artist if you just want to give them some money because you like them. Um, so that's a quick little thing there. Uh, this was the first work of art placed into the museum. Uh, one of my concepts, wanting to be able to see what it would feel like to actually fabricate it, to stand close to it before I ever bought any material. Um, this is an artist named Gilles Brevel out of Houston, Texas, working in uh, stainless steel casting. Um, so we were able to take a concept that was designed in the computer, has yet to be fabricated, and, and put it into env an environment where hopefully collectors or uh, arts commissions can see it and, and you know, engage with Gilles. Um, Andrew Zuckerman is a filmmaker and photographer uh, working in high-resolution photography. Um, so we were able to put Andrew into the gallery, and we actually blew out one of the walls and created an, a special gallery for him that would allow us to put the giraffe at full scale. Um, and you know, being able to do things in this museum that you can't do here, we can actually fly. So we were able to fly up and look into the eye of the giraffe and really see the resolution of the eye of the giraffe. And so the things that you can do in this space are pretty extraordinary. Uh, Gordon Huther is an artist out of Napa. Um, this 
has not be, yet been fabricated, but um, certainly could. Um, so what I'm really interested in is the way in which we can show these artworks and they are fully able to be realized. Nothing here is, is overly fantastic that we cannot achieve them. Uh, Bunny Reese is a muralist and we were able to help her imagine her murals in, in three dimension. Um, so we, you can see her mural has been wrapped over this three dimensional um, sculpture. And so we've captured the painting and the texture and all of her brush strokes. Uh, there's the mural on the wall behind her, uh, behind the sculpture. And so we've actually fabricated that sculpture in the shop now. So it lives in the museum and it's fully realized in our studio down in the Bayview. Um, again, for artists, you know, they're able to show their paintings. This is Aaron Glasson out of Joshua Tree. And we've actually worked with Aaron to turn some of his paintings into sculptures. So we're able to pull the shapes and forms from his paintings and help him imagine what it would look like to work in a sculptural uh, form. Uh, Chris Itzel, he's a, a sculptor working in six to eight foot scale normally. We're able to show him what his artwork would look like if he was working at monolithic, you know, monumental scale for public artworks. Again, all of these are, you're able to walk around them and really stand under them and feel what it would be like to, to stand that close to it. Um, this is Vera Dalla out of New York. She's a printmaker and uh, painter. The, this sculpture has not been fabricated. She had a digital model that she made. She sculpted in clay, she 3D scanned it, she gave us the model and then we rendered it for her. So being able you know, for her to see her concept rendered um, before ever going to uh, fabrication. Uh, and you know, for public arts, we, we see this as a great opportunity for cities and arts commissions to be able to you know, find artists uh, before, you know, give them the opportunity. Hopefully we can you know, create more access for more artists and um, open up the doors for you know, other, you know, artists who might not otherwise be able to show their work uh, prior to being commissioned. Uh, and then we see this also being a place where people can just eventually, they'll just show up and you'll be able to walk around the museum with your friends and experience what it feels like to, you know, it, it very much does offer a similar feeling of being in a, in a beautiful art museum or being at a park. Uh, it is quite amazing how um, it triggers much of the same sensation. Um, Again, just kind of showing more of, you know, what the space feels like. Also highlighting some, you know, again, for me was designing the, um, for me to be able to design concepts prior to ever making them. Uh, that was the origin of this museum. It's now opened up so much more and it's really what excited me about the reality of the metaverse. And so, um, uh, again, kind of having this uh, along with Fog Fair, wanting to reach out and say, like, how can we share this excitement with everybody? Um, and so um, with that, um, we can just kind of jump into talking a little bit more about, um, I think about, you know, mine and Zesty's, you know, excitement about this and uh, hopefully also hear from some of you all and see if there's anything we can do to um, answer questions. But I will say that, um, you know, I was just listening to an article this morning about Microsoft buying a, a very large video game company and specifically to invest into the metaverse. And the it clearly identified in the article is that nobody knows anything about the metaverse. And so I, Zesty and I are certainly not, um, you know, the, uh, we don't know it all up here, but it's, we would like to have a conversation about, um, you know, what's happening here. Yeah, and or how people can break down the conventions of what they were taught at like university. Um, the jeweler used to just be a jeweler or the ceramicist was just a ceramicist. Um, this from what Marcus was just showing gives people the, the, a way to take chance uh, at very low cost, and it also increases the value of time. Um, and I think this is, uh, you know, what, an amazing tool for people to use that maybe don't have the actual resources to be able to um, test something out. Would it work? Could it work? How does it fit into space? Um, this is so important with the value of time. You know, and, and time is our most precious thing, and how to do more of what we want. And I also think all these conceptions of how we once taught are, will will change because every uh, young person I know going to a an arts type school now today does you know many different kinds of things, um, and most of them are interested in many different kinds of things, and we should be encouraging that. And I think one of the things and I was speaking to uh, uh, some Stanleys in the audience today, and I was speaking to him earlier about um, how we, we how do we go find something precious when we were kids, you know, getting something from Europe was really special, or taking it we we travel to go find things that we can't have. 
And, um, and we also sometimes forget regionally, like where we are, there's amazing things around us, but we often get these um, other things like we want to go here to go find things. We want to go exploring, or at least that's what we were talking about, what we do or the way we find passion. But I think this is another way that people will be able to go exploring to find things or find ability in a way to have something created that they didn't know existed before or to push or help push in the right way for people to develop skills that they actually have and the wants and desires that they could never get out before. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, something um, as the artists that you're representing, uh, do you feel like they are, um, many of them are aware of the potential of this resource? Or is there pushback from some of them as kind of like, it's not authentic, or is there, um, are you seeing excitement in the, in the designers that you're working with? Yeah, I, I think um, there's a lot of them that will be very right for this, and I don't think all of them are quite ready for it, and I don't think some of them will be right, which I think is the right way to look at it. There's where, at least us as a gallery, we're not in a rush. It's, it's the way that we think we can back, it's the same thing we would do with them before this technology existed. What is the best way to get them presented and to find a public that would want to be interested or to buy into their work? And we will do the same thing as the metaverse develops. Um, there's no rush just to put out a bunch of NFTs because anybody can by pressing some buttons. It has to be right for where the artist is going, what they're thinking, what other goals they want to accomplish. Um, for us, and there's many of them that have come and expressed that they are. So we've started to do some testing, and I think testing is also really important in the sense of time instead of just rushing in because it exists. Um, we will eventually be there. This might take us a whole year to really develop. It's not, it could take a year and a half for us to really put it out there um, as technology keeps changing. But the thing is we're researching and, and trying to grow for them or with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that, you know, um, one thing we were talking about as well is the, you know, there's, this is a generational, there's a, there's a generational understanding here and, you know, um, you know, there is a lot of money out there, but there's a generation of youth that are growing up and they're, they're also, you know, excited to kind of design and create and having this ability to be an architect and design a home or design, you know, um, a gallery of your own, uh, and then to think about curating your own home and the home that you may never build, but you still get to, you know, explore your design sensibilities uh, and and become um, to build your collection of artists that you're excited to be aware of and to have the opportunity to collect those artists. Um, there's an interesting component to NFTs and design becoming collectible as representation. And so, you know, there's not only that, but that, that young person or anybody out there who's interested in kind of collecting because they simply love design, um, there's a time and day where they might afford um, to, to come to R and Company and actually buy that artist's work. And so is there, you know, is there something interesting you see there? Uh, uh, completely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I also think we're working with a, uh, a, a generation that grew up coding. And the people that grow up coding use a different part of their brain than um, the people that create with us. When um, I show a furniture designer or a ceramicist or someone that makes things in metal, they are physical. They're physically making, right? The painters still, phys most painters physically paint their thing. Most people that are working in the tech industry, even for some of the images we're seeing here, are, are thinking in a different way. They don't use, it's using a different part of the brain. And I think this is a, a way to really start to put these two worlds together for creativity. Yeah, I think you know that's something. What you just mentioned something that's very important to me as as a as a maker. You know, uh, my entire much of my um, life is spent in a shop building, um, turning raw materials into beautiful, you know, spaces or beautiful elements, design, you know, uh, lighting installations. Um, and so for me, when I think about the metaverse, I want to make sure that we're not all thinking about it as a, a one-way road, that we're not going to the metaverse. We're going to be here still. And there's this really you know, beautiful idea about the liminal space between our real world and the metaverse and, and back again. And we're, go we're going to be traveling in and out of the metaverse. It's no different than the amount of time you spend currently looking at your, cell, your, your mobile device, um, traveling to different websites, um, you know, what the metaverse really represents is the ability for us to tether all of these kind of um, disparate 
websites, different companies who are not linked together, um, it will eventually offer us the ability to travel as yourself, as an avatar, from place to place, much like your, your current real world experience. Um, I, I think that, uh, and then back out again. So how do we go to somebody's showroom in the metaverse, but then you know, bring an experience back out into this ex this real world experience. And so I, I know that there's likely some um, concern about what, what does the metaverse represent and are we always going to be inside of uh, our headsets? And I don't believe that. I think that we're all very well grounded in our real world experience. And I, I think, I hope that the metaverse actually allows more artists, more designers to show their work and for there to be more, um, uh, you know, um, buy-in from people and it, it allows more custom works of art to be made where we start to see the, the kind of artist DIY custom um, movement really take shape even more because you can show it. I agree. Maybe we should ask if there's any questions or if uh, <laughs> people want to tell us we're completely wrong or somewhat crazy or maybe just happy. Maybe. Um, I think you're wonderful and visionary. I think it's a very exciting. Uh, you're opening up something completely new to me. Um, but, uh, but I have a question to Zesty. In terms of, you refer to representation of artists who are starting to work this way. What do you see as your way of representing these artists? Who are you representing them to? Um, you know, how, how would that be fulfilled in, in a practical sense? Well, that's a good question. Um, so maybe in that sense, uh, that gets us into part of what we do is actually, we're sort of like a talent agency sometimes as well. Never mind do we represent the actual physical thing that people represent. It depends what, what each individual wants. There's not gonna be any straight one way. But what, one of the things that we have the ability to do or who we have the ability to partner with is to get exposure. And that's where I think, um, you know, I think the most, yes, could, could someone represent themselves in it? Of course they can. But could we add value and layer that up and to find more or to make their life easier so we do what, what they don't want to do? I think would be the same thing from the physical to um, the augmented world. Hi, um, are there any plans to take Archive Virtualis off of headsets and into a non-headset world, I get kind of seasick on them. <laughs> well, it currently it, 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 it's so technology is is evolving rapidly. Um, right now, in in the next week, when you go to the website, you would be able to do a download. You can download it as a Mac version or a PC version. It's desktop compatible as well. You can navigate by using the keys on your keyboard. So you would be able to go and, and navigate and, and look at the artwork and engage in that way. Um, as far as building it, um, I would love to build this museum. Just find me a, uh, a place in Dubai and, and let's build it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you guys, this is fantastic and um, illuminating and um, took something that I couldn't quite grasp and I still can't grasp it, but it's a little bit closer. But I have a question about experience. Marcus, you keep talking about this experience, experience, experience. So much of our lives is built on experience, even looking at artwork, looking at design, um, the interaction of one person with another and um, sort of expanding our, our own view of what we're, what we're looking at by being together and having that shared experience. So in, in a... Um, a VR experience or a g going into this with, uh, I expect you're an avatar and you go into something, Zesty, you're selling design. I'm looking at work that you're selling and can I bring in a friend? Marcus, you said you could bring in friends or uh, Zesty, you were talking about getting together for meetings where you're all together in a meeting and 
you know, a, a sort of tricked out place that's, that's beautiful, that you've created this environment, but can one have an experience with another person in that environment or in front of that piece of art or design mm -hmm. to sort of riff off of each other and, you know, get excited about it? Um, I'm, I guess I'm talking more as, you know, a consumer. Yeah. I mean, I would say currently, um, right now, I, I'm actually able to meet people in the museum. If I send them the download file, I can give them an IP address. They can join me in the museum. I've walked around. I've had meetings with six people at one time, and we have walked around and looked at artwork, stood there and talked about, um, you know, how is how your children are doing or what you had for dinner last night it's very similar to the way, you know way in which we would communicate however we're just in this alternate space that's with that you know we all traveled to together so the technology is definitely there now uh, as i said when we tether our headsets or our augmented lenses to to a 5g cellular uh, technology we'll be able to go there streaming there will be no download anymore you'll just click in and go um, Again, though, you know, these are just alternate experiences. I don't think that anyone's, th you know, I'm certainly not expecting this to um, create, an, you know, the um, become the normal. Um, I hope we all continue to, to come here and be in person with each other. Um, but it does, I, I do think there's some really exciting things about being able to meet your friends um, from London and Tokyo and all come together in one place instead of looking at a, a Zoom screen. And we're actually now experiencing a beautiful, um, you know, it's like going to a website together, but it's fully immersive and you can be in a museum or you could be, um, you know, at, watching a music performance and it's live, it's, the live stream is happening in Berlin and your, your whole audience is around the world watching your live stream. And that technology is readily available. I, I, I completely agree with that and being able to be able to do that. And for you to, even if it's something you want to buy for yourself, to be able to put it in your own dwelling to see if it would work to walk around it. You can't, you don't have the tactile sensation, the physical that I was speaking about before, but you have the visual and maybe then the visual, your, your brain will develop visual in a different way or that you would really believe like, oh, this does really, really work or this is really awful, right? <laughs> um, it, it, and, and, and those extremes are good to be able to, and then that would be the part of training. But I, I think we can also go, backwards you know we've our whole life we've been trained to get to this moment you know it started off with you know advertisement was no different circulars in the sunday newspaper would be the next thing infomercials would be the next part of digital right uh, qvc would be the next part of digital um of like whoever thought any of that could actually happen right this is all now we're getting into all digital things and now watch um are any of us going to need to go to walmart anymore how are we going to, you know, maybe we're going to go to Walmart inside of the metaverse and our personal shopper will be there for Walmart, which doesn't even sound like it could be a thing, but I bet you it will be a thing sooner than not. And you, they will take you around or know what you want or show you products in a way because all the advertisers has made their avatars or some other video or a way to give you experience in there to be able to accomplish these goals. You will then be, you'll be given and they'll send them to you and you'll download NFTs as your circular to go to anything as the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade this year started to sell them as well. Thank you, really interesting ideas and visuals. And you mentioned before that you encourage spatial thinkers, creative artists to start redesigning the metaverse. And I'm thinking about the practical aspects of that. My first thought was, what do you tell someone, create a website and design something your own personal website? And my question is, what are your action items to actually start redesigning this metaverse right now? Uh, well, depending upon what, you know, what medium you work in or, or any of that, I would say, you know, there are, um, you know, resources out there to begin designing in 3D, um, to imagine your concept, to work with a sketch artist who can sketch in 3D. Um, I, my, Eduardo, who is sitting here in the room with me, he's he, right here in the front. He designed, he actually was a, allowed me to think spatially and design the, the, the architectural space and, and then render that into, um, the game engine, which allows us to move through it. And so I think there are a lot of people out there who are able to use this technology. Uh, and, you know, if you are able to direct them or, you know, as far as give them a sketch, um, I think that's that's the pathway into 
um, getting your ideas into you know 3D and then ultimately into a game engine rendering software so they can be rendered. Um, from that, it, it, it's really, I mean, I say it's easy, but you know, there's a lot of the you know younger generation are really quick at this technology. It's um, it's readily available. It, it operates on a laptop. It's it's not that expensive to to buy the software. Um, and I think you know we have a generation of kids that have grown up playing video games, and they they take to this software really quickly. So I would say to connect with a young person who is working in this software and and help direct them as as a designer or an artist yourself, um, or share that show them your work. 3D scanning is a way to get it into digital medium. So, but but let's talk about how else this is. We, we've also grown up with things that are digitized because we look at images all the time in the magazines. If we read online, still read a newspaper or magazine. And a lot of those images are, are bought or paid for to be printed, like from like Getty Images, let's say. And Getty Images has uh, millions of photos. Who knows? I don't even know how many they have that anybody can pull from if they paid a fee to use the photos and whatever they're doing for whatever those fees are. In the, for the metaverse, for what maybe you're talking about as well, if you have a, a concept design, but it needs to be on a certain kind of grass, let's say. You can already go and rent the grass. You can buy the grass for pennies. It's already there. Um, you just have to go find these. In, or if you wanted a, a purple orchid, orchid compared to a blue orchid or a different kind of tree, a fantail palm compared to this palm tree, et cetera, these things are already all there. And the idea that you can already place them in and it, it, it's, they're that real is unbelievable that it hasn't gotten out there for everybody to start using so they could have whatever behind them on their photo for their social media and other things besides a, a simple picture or other things that define them or the things they want to be surrounded by. But these websites are vastly growing, sort of like what happened with a you know, the amount of information that we got uh, get from social media or on a YouTube. The idea of the things or those kinds of real things in our life or the looking at the high definition photography, all that is already there in a different way if you wanted to use things like this that, that are actually gonna, gonna end up costing pennies on the dollar to be able to use them forever. Yeah, there, there are definitely, you know, um, three-dimensional warehouses or catalogs of resources you can download, models that already exist that you can then take and alter to make your own. Um, as, as Zesty mentioned, they're readily available for that type of, you know, concept. So I have a question that is AI art. So art uh, generated by words, by text, and fungible tokens and NFTs. And uh, AI art is, is, you know, going at the speed of light, literally, and is actually very accessible to turn it, words and text into art. And I want to know, that is, uh, we didn't, you didn't talk about that kind of art, and I want to know your thoughts. Sure. Um, the, on, the, on the tech side, or from AI, um, it's really already been defined what um, that asset class wants as art. Uh, a definition could be, uh, it's called, uh, let's use CryptoPunks as something that's become insanely popular through that world, which are basically pixelated images um, of, of faces, basically of heads. Um, and they've become incredibly popular um, and now sell for incredible sums of money. And this has taken off in that industry. But I think it's something that they've known. So uh, that part of the tech world that has this access, has this money, that thinks this way, that I've sort of suggested uses a different part of their brain, this is the kind of type of art that most of them are interested in. The other art that we have in the building today, they're not interested in this. Mm -hmm. They've already made their mark that they're going here. So this is a new asset class. This is going to be the new generational wealth that the first time we ever see it in the history of our lives is gonna come out of this kind of community in a way of a collectability, a sourceability. Um, all of that community that is already purchasing this could have already bought all of this art in this building, but they've chosen not to. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, I am talking about AI art. Yeah. So writing saying. an algorithm that creates the art. From words. Right. And that From, is new, right. actually. Or, in, or any other aspect of how they're doing that. So you can program, any of this can be programmed where a coding or algorithm comes out um, that it, it, it changes either color, shape, form, and other such things. I, I don't, I'm not, an, I've seen some of it. 
the CryptoPunks are that. They, that's how they've grown or other such ones like this or, or they've written a program that makes more and more of them come out or all of a sudden there could be 10,000 of them, yeah. right? The, the programs might not ever end. Depends on the data set. Depends on how many data sets you have. So of yeah. course. You I think, you know, one artist that I'm, I've been watching, Rafik Anadol, is somebody to pay attention to who's using data to create content and, you know, using... Um, many, many photographs of images from, you know, uh, Renaissance paintings or from sculptures, you know, from antiquities and then being able to feed those into an AI, a, a, you know, a, um, uh, you know, a computer that's thinking and then regenerating all of that information and it begins to create its own sculpture based on all of that information or it begins to create its own paintings based on that. And so, um, Certainly, you could feed in, and people have done it. They're feeding in, you know, collectible collectible furniture, and it's regenerating furniture designs. And, you know, I don't. I, I think it's quite interesting, and I don't know where it'll all go. And if I, yeah. I want to yeah. add, add to that a little bit, because what you're talking about by using words and code, coders are going to go away, because the coders that came up with that have had these incredible jobs have already done the work, yeah. right? So coding is is something we're going to be able to talk to our computer, talk to our system and it will code what we say or ask for it to do in the future because of all the language that's already been developed. So this will only come faster and be easier. Um, and, and as that part, and the computers um, have been taught how to think, right? So, so that is another interesting part because, so I do robotics. So it, with robotics, what you do, you don't program. You have the operator that maybe doesn't have a degree in anything that decides that that arm has to move instead of up and down, has to move horizontally and pick up something else. You don't program, you just take the arm and you do the movement. And so in that sense, what you're saying is exactly amazing because we are, we are already there. We don't, need, we don't need programmers in many aspects of robotics and building cars, for example, or whatever else, or building yeah. art. Yeah. And you know, so there, that interface is gone, and you're completely right, and is amazing. And, the, you know, there, there was a cyborg that was stopped at the Egyptian border recently, um, and they thought it was a spy. But she was really, it's a she, as it's been described in writing, uh, was going there to have her um, art show from the art that the cyborg had actually created. And they actually detained her for eight days. <laughs> and you guys can look this up. This is all real. Um, and, this, and there's more and more of them that are going to be coming that will generate different things or be able to do your gesture through a VR platform or through a spoken word platform. Hey, um, so my question, uh, I believe, it's vaguely ties into the last two, but uh, I'm just interested in the, the creative side of the equation or the creativity um, it, the human aspect of it, not just generativity, like the you know AI variations and so on. I was just I was just reminded of uh, some AI research, you know, showing all these different sort of uh, cool furniture designs that it could spit out based on learning from from art furniture. But I'm interested in sort of the UX of creation in this new uh, material. Um, so if you could look into like 10 years from now, uh, what are some possibilities for, rather than uh, the creator um, coming up with concept, doing sketches, giving it to uh, coders mm -hmm. to put into this new medium, instead, what are the possibilities for the creator to be, uh, you know, in a two-way creative process with the, the new material? Sure, I mean, I, th I think, it's more people will be able to complete the thought or the vision or the idea, I think is really going to become, or, and I think what it will do in the end is, um, you know, let's, let's look at taste and style of the millionaire to get to answer your question in a roundabout way. So about 120 years ago, the, you know, um, we only grew uh, for, by century by defining the taste of wealth that then became the uh, wealth or how it trickled down. So this will be right back to your question. So if we, about 120 years ago, we look at a good example of defining taste, it only ever comes from the artisans. So a great example of how the new wealth wanted to show off their creations was in the area of Newport, Rhode Island and the mansions they built. But one had different aesthetics than the other or how to use different techniques, right? Because this is what you're sort of getting at. And then throughout the century, it translates down to a TV show that would be called MTV Cribs of people wanting scale or a stucco palace, 
right? So that's in everyone in the world, no matter what they have, if they have nothing or if they have everything, wants to define who they are or their taste. We're, we're wired this way with aesthetics. Um, this has been proven all over the world in coat drives in different countries of what people pick out. People don't normally pick out the warmest coat if they don't have one. They pick out the color that they're attracted to. And there's been more and more of these studies that are done. And so we're, we're, we're built this way inherently and even if we don't know it. So I think in the future for the people that have this ability, on what, whatever level it is, if it's for the fantasy because I only can live with it in the metaverse or if I can design it partially in the metaverse and make it into my world, then I will have, my, I will have it in a reality or I'll have it in a virtual world to be able to complete all of my thoughts and send it off for fabrication for the people that can complete the thought. Yeah, you just made me think of, you know, uh, the way in which people kind of get inspired now at Pinterest has really, you know, allowed people to kind of send images back and forth. Like, what do you think about this and this? And as we were talking about, you know, machine learning, being able to, you as an artist, find, you know, six different things that really inspire you. It's kind of like digital collaging, where you take the things you're inspired by, you feed it into the machine, the machine spits out, and you're like, yeah, maybe that a little bit, maybe this, I want a little of this in there, and I throw a little of that in there. And before you know it, the machine has actually created the thing that you've been thinking of just by feeding it a couple of images. And then from there, it'll actually build your three-dimensional virtual metaverse creation. And then from there, you can define what your material is, whether you want to 3D print it, do you want to CNC carve it? You know, how do you want to bring that back into this world? But I, I do think that that's very easily achievable with machine learning right now. You feed it the images and you're going to just guide that machine to give you what you're, what you're envisioning. Um, I already had a chance to talk, but the Rashad Newsom, who's got a, a video installation in, at Minnesota Street Project and is going to have a huge, um, I, I, it, it's dance, theater, education. He programmed a robot named Being to create poetry with a, an Oakland poet. So mm -hmm. I, I thought that was very, very cool. And uh, I, I just find the community very international, very broad, very giving opportunity to people that those don't necessarily have the opportunity. It's great. I think he wanted to ask, ask something. <laughs> well, actually, I have a lot of things I want to ask, but I'm, I can't possibly ask them all. With every phrase you guys spoke, I feel like there was a question <laughs> that I wanted to shoot out. But if we combine robotics and what you're doing, if you think, just jump into the future a little bit, what is the human domicile going to look like? What, is our, what are our senses going to be? How are we actually going to communicate with one another using senses if, in fact, it's all virtual? And I do believe, as horrifying as it sounds to us, the future could possibly be that. We, keep, we continue to grow this. Yeah. That's what's mm -hmm. happening. Good question. Uh, I, 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 I think the senses are very, very important here. And I think... And my bigger goal with this is that I think I will be able to get to people that then want that sensory experience. If it's with tact tactile, smell, taste, et cetera. And I think more of this will actually get incorporated into whatever kind of dwelling people actually have because they've gotten to experience something that they might really want in a different way. I think it will come back into a reality in a way that will make us stronger as individuals. I also think it's, you know, generationally, we are all very um, keen on all of our senses being triggered, you know, smell and touch and all of that is extremely important to us. We've all grown up with it. We've lived our lives with it. But there is a generation of children being born that will experience life differently and touch and smell become less necessary because it's just the life they're living. And um, whether that's sad or good or whatever it's gonna happen and so um, and then also they're working on technologies that are that are getting really you know they will replicate touch to some degree um, and they will you know we're, they're working on um, sensors such as smell and being able to bring that to fruition but I mean I think we all know that those are the the thresholds where it's going to run into some real real issues of you know how do we really touch or smell um, you know I think that's that's the challenge yeah Agreed. That's a great question. What 
mean, there is not just one metaverse. There are so many different ones. I mean, how do you, your virtual museum of concept art, how do you hook up with other metaverses? How, how do you communicate with people who have the such ultimate, things? ultimate, ultimate question? Yes. I don't think anyone has that answer yet, and hopefully there'll be a door into the next one because it's no different than anything that's uh, come to market and there's more than one or, or many, many, many. Um, eventually, it, it has to come into some kind of focus. And yeah. so the marketplace will detect that, depict that bigger than us. And, I, and I, it will have to be uh, consume into each other or grow next to each other somehow. I mean, in that way, how long can we afford decentralization? I mean, until Microsoft, Google, Apple just eat it all up, <laughs> well, right? Yeah. You know, capitalism isn't, is uh, no different in the metaverse yeah. as it is in the real world, so it's too late. I think that you know we are we all hope that it doesn't become the Amazon metaverse or the the um, you know the Google metaverse. They're certainly going to stake their claim, uh, but I, you know blockchain technology is really going to be central to the decentralization of that. I mean we I think with blockchain technology we will be able to own our own data, our own information, our own avatars, and through that we'll be able to move between people's you know, worlds that they create, ultimately creating the tether that is the metaverse. Um, but, but how that all happens, I don't think, certainly not Zesty and I know. <laughs> not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>